One of the things that we saw is like all, all of these networks of right wing accounts were just happily, excitedly looking for any kind of possible issue with voting, and then they would amplify that. And in all cases, what it did was it created this exaggerated sense that you couldn't trust the election results. I'm Quinta Jurassic, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, June 30th, 2022. Today, we're bringing you an episode of our Arbiters of Truth series on the online information ecosystem. The House committee investigating the January 6th insurrection is midway through a blockbuster series of hearings exploring Donald Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election and disrupt the peaceful transfer of power. Central to those efforts, of course, was the big lie, the false notion that Trump was cheated out of victory in 2020. This week, Evelyn Dweck and I spoke with Kate Starbird, an associate professor of human-centered design and engineering at the University of Washington, and repeat Arbiters of Truth guest. Kate has come on the show before to talk about misinformation on January 6th, and she and a team of co-authors just released a comprehensive analysis of tweets spreading misinformation around the 2020 election. So she's the perfect person with whom to discuss the January 6th committee hearings and misinformation. What does Kate's research show about how election falsehoods spread and who spread them? How has and hasn't the January 6th committee incorporated the role of misinformation into the story it's telling about the insurrection? And is there any chance that the committee can break through and get the truth to the people who most need to hear it? It's the Lawfare Podcast, June 30th. The January 6th committee takes on the big lie. So to start off, I, I know from, from Twitter that you've been following the January 6th hearings that have been taking place over the last few weeks. I've been very impressed so far with how the committee has handled what I think is a, a pretty difficult task of presenting a lot of complicated information to a potentially distracted audience about something that happened over a year ago. Obviously, you study in part how information travels. So I'm curious what you've made of the hearings and if you think they've been successful in presenting this story. I mean, it's hard to know how they're going to measure success. I, I think it's really important to kind of think about the different potential audiences uh, that they may be speaking to. And one is the general public, but there also may be people that are decision makers in different kinds of places or people that may have the ability to, you know, <laughs> Take 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 action and and change you know how our our government is addressing some of these problems and so I I do think when I'm looking at them I kind of think of like oh, what which audience is this for and for someone like me who's been working in this space of sort of un, trying to understand and unpack what the big lie was and how it happened and then then how that leads to January six I think there are a couple of things that have been really helpful in illuminating um, and also really helpful just like to be perfectly honest, I give talks all the time about this. And sometimes I feel like I'm on stable ground because it's still so contested. And the, these hearings have just had so much clarity. Like these, these claims were not true. And they're the people that should be trusted to be able to say whether they're true or not, including Bill Barr, are saying they are not true. And all of a sudden I'm giving these talks and I feel like I'm on much steadier ground when I give when I give these talks because I've been saying they're not true, but now we have the weight of these kind of statements behind us. That's really interesting. And I think uh, maybe speaks well to the committee's strategy of sort of using witnesses that perhaps, you know, who normally would be inclined to agree with Trump, right? So Bill Barr, of course, being the, the attorney general, I think it's fair to say a pretty full-throated supporter of Trump. And yet they have him on tape saying uh, that Trump's claims of voter fraud were bullshit. And that is a direct quote. I do want to talk about, you know, the, the specifics of the role of falsehoods, misinformation, disinformation in the hearings. The committee so far, they've, they've sort of convened hearings mostly around different kind of themes. So Trump's efforts to pressure state election officials, uh, his efforts to upend the certification of the electoral vote in Congress. Uh, none of the hearings have so far directly been about the question of election fal falsehoods and how those sort of percolate in the information environment. But I do think it's probably fair to say that, you know, misinformation and disinformation and how those spread is kind of implicit in a lot of what the committee has been doing. So how do you see the interaction of what you study in terms of the movement of information and crisis informatics with the hearings so far? 
It, it's I mean, it's it's hard to say. Yeah, you're right. It's like there's a there's a subtext there with what was happening on social media and in the broader information space. Um, and there are example tweets that have been that have been put forward to show sort of like how how especially Donald Trump. Um, we've seen some of his tweets. We've seen some other tweets. I think, but there's so much more around how social media were leveraged to sort of create this this you know this false narrative, this false meta narrative that. Um, they were systematic uh, and impactful voter fraud. And I know that they have gathered information. I know they've talked to social media researchers in different ways, but I'm not sure how that will that will play out in the hearings themselves. But for me, I kind of see a lot of that sort of underneath some of the other conversations that are being had. Certainly social media were used to, to organize and bring things, bring the stop the steal movement together, which brings a lot of those people to the the Capitol building, well, to the ellipse and then the Capitol building on, on January 6th. And, and that's a piece I think they haven't quite articulated. Um, they've really focused a little bit more on the organized piece of that. So the Proud Boys and, and, and the Oath Keepers and others that were there without kind of seeing like the rest of the crowd that enters the Capitol building, a lot of that comes a little, you know, comes from more of the diffuse disinformation that was spreading um, on social media at the time. And, and, and they haven't quite made that connection. But I think that the things that they've showed about the, the, the parts that were truly organized, I think has been really, again, really insightful for me as a researcher who've been, who's been studying the social media side to now see where the intersection between the sort of organic people that were, were kind of just caught up in the moment versus the like coordinated pieces and how those sort of complemented each other and led to the events that we see on January 6th. Yeah, I'd love to talk a little bit more about the sort of disconnect between that. You know, so much of the discourse in the circles that we travel in uh, post-January 6th in the last couple of years has been about the role of tech companies in the lead up to, to the insurrection. And, you know, there was speculation that there would be time dedicated to that in the hearings, but there hasn't been so far. They haven't really zeroed in on that. And, you know, we do know for a fact that the committee has been in contact with the tech platforms and has been studying uh, their role, but it still hasn't been front and center in a way that it has been in much of the public discourse about this. And so that disconnect is somewhat striking because, you know, as you were saying, so much of the, uh, so much of this disinformation was fermented online was circulating online, but the committee is really focusing on the organized aspects and the disinformation that was coming from the top, uh, mainly in, you know, many offline formats. And so, you know, what should we make of that? Does it maybe suggest that public debate overemphasizes the role of online disinformation or is it something to do with the committee's expertise in particular? You know, has that been striking to you? I don't know. I I don't think it's been striking and surprising. I mean, this, this is all unprecedented, right? Like this, this is all stuff that we haven't prepared for. And I, I guess I went in with a, without a lot of expectations. So I, I can't say I've, I've been surprised by that balance, but I, again, I think about like, who is their audience and, and what are their goals in, ter- in terms of like which evidence they're bringing to the fore? And I think, you know, we've had a lot of hearings that are just like, let's attack the social media platforms. And a lot of us have been critical of the social media platforms in different ways. But is is this moment about that? Um, because I think it could become that. Uh, but is is that really helpful in this moment? Or do we really want to look at, you know, what were the more organized pieces here and and how, how were specific actors you know, breaking laws, pressuring people. I mean, this is, there's, there's these legal aspects uh, here that I think are, that are so important. And though um, I do think social media and other, you know, just not not even social media, that our information space played a role and social media are part of that information space. Cable news also played a role in what happened. And we could point out particular cable news outlets as well, but I don't think there's a legal aspect there that necessitates spending too much of the hearings on that. I do think there might be an opportunity for like one hearing that kind of connects the social media activity and especially this idea that Donald Trump and his supporters and and right-wing media were using social media in a very particular kind of way that stirred up that larger crowd and that that larger crowd intersected with those those organized militias in the lead up and and in the moments that they they go into 
the Capitol on January 6th. I think there is some opportunity there. I, I don't I, I don't know that it has to become part of the hearings, but I think it would be a valuable just final connector um, for all of the different pieces that help people understand what happens on January 6th. But I do, I understand being a little concerned about, you know, making the social media companies into the villains here. I think there are things they could have done better, but I think making them into the villains here is probably not the most valuable thing that the hearing could, hearings could do. That's a really interesting point about legal accountability. And I do think that from my perspective, as someone who's been watching the hearings quite closely, a lot of what the committee seems to be doing is kind of trying to build a moral, political, legal case against Trump specifically and some of the people around him. And so I think it it makes a great deal of sense, as you say, that, you know, Facebook's role (laughs) is kind of ancillary to that. Um, I will say it has been funny to watch them, you know, put up particular Trump tweets on the screen and realize that, of course, those are actually recreations <laughs> of Trump tweets because, uh, as we all know, the president is or the former president is is no longer on Twitter. So there's kind of a, a little bit of an implicit reminder there of what the platforms were doing around that time or what they did immediately afterward. Yeah, I mean, are they are they recreations or, or screenshots at the time? Because I know a lot of us have screenshots at the time. We were <laughs> rapidly trying to capture those as soon as we could, knowing that that things are so ephemeral. But it is interesting to know that the you know you can't find them anymore because because the platforms have taken action. I I do think I mean there's a lot of I still think uncertainty in terms of like what we really want these platforms to do. And every day, you know, as, as different things kind of happen and, and the things that have happened in just the last few days, you know, have made, have, have just put a spotlight on, on, on this fact that, you know, the platforms are in a hard place and we may not want them over moderating speech. At the same time, I do think there's a value in pointing out and highlighting how Donald Trump and others use those platforms very specifically that led up to that violence that co- sort of justify those actions that were taken by the platforms to, to suspend that account and other accounts that, that did similar kinds of things. I think there's some value there, especially if, if we think that reinstating that account might be harmful to our political discourse and our political futures. Um, and so there, there may be some value for the, for the hearings in, in, in highlighting that relationship for that reason as well. So you have a new paper out um, with a number of co-authors on election delegitimization on Twitter in 2020. And I'd love to congratulate you on on your excellent timing. Uh, timing things for publication in academic circles is not always so easy, but you really nailed the landing on this one. So good work. You know, can you walk us through what you found in that work? Yeah, and first of all, that was we, it was not timed. It was it was totally a, an accident. In fact, we were talking with the editors. Okay, I'm going to hit the button and publish today. I was like, today, <laughs> knowing that the hearings were starting like the next day or was just right after the first hearing or something. But um, we'd been working on that for years. In fact, we'd done some early analysis in 2020 in the fall that, that started to do this. And so, what we were doing, we 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 at the University of Washington were working with a huge team, including collaborators at Stanford. Um, as well as the DFR lab and Graphica to do real-time identification of false, misleading, exaggerated, and unsubstantiated claims about election processes and procedures, including those that were sowing doubt in election results. And so we had a team of over 100 researchers that were in real time trying to find these claims and, 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 and aggregate them. And we were actually responding in different ways, letting platforms know if there was a viral claim that looked harmful and uh, and also talking to to journalists, doing press conferences, and trying to help people understand how and why these claims were were spreading. I mean, before we knew what the big lie was, we were studying it in this sort of real time way. And in I think in November, but maybe even earlier, might have even been October, we put out our first sort of analysis of who were the the accounts that were most influential in the spread of these of these false narratives or these false stories. Um, or these, and often they weren't outright false. They're mis, they're misleading, right? So claims that you know ballots had been thrown away in the trash can, and people said, "Oh, look, you know, we can't trust the process." Well, no, ballots get thrown away sometimes, and and it's not really going to make an impact. And and normally people can figure out and, and and fix the ballot in different kinds of ways. And so we, you know, we were we were highlighting, you know, how and kind of explaining and giving context to some of these claims in real time. So we went. We went back. And we when we identified these repeat 
these repeat spreaders, the, the accounts that were most influential. And by most influential, we meant that they were, we, we did a Twitter focused analysis in this case because Twitter data is available, but accounts that were retweeted more than a thousand times for multiple different kinds of claims. So not just, they didn't just share like false claims about, you know, dead people voting, or they didn't just share misleading claims that ballots have been thrown in the trash, but they shared like six or eight different claims and they were influential in the spread. So we did this first sort of analysis and put that out. In the years since, what we've done is we've gone back with a fine tooth comb and tried to like very specifically match up, you know, all the tweets that are associated with false and misleading claims that sow doubt in the election. So it's a very specific kind of a claim. And then identified the, the the accounts that were these sort of repeat spreaders, and we have a list of I think thirty five that um, spread eight or more different different incidents, and and are happy to talk to folks about about that list and who's on it, and and how and and how you know different accounts use different tactics. Some accounts never say things that are outright false, but they advance these false narratives very carefully by saying someone else said something, or oh, there's been a lawsuit filed about dead voters, or you know, Sharpies are bleeding through. And so they're really careful about how they participate, but they absolutely like forwarded all of these narratives. And then there's some accounts like, um, you know, Gateway Pundit and things that were just absolutely like just saying outright false things um, repeatedly that kind of built this, this, you know, fed the big lie and resonated. This, these were the accounts that were, that were supporting the, the larger meta narrative of, uh, of election fraud. And Donald Trump's on that list, and he's one of the top ones, including his and his two sons are there. And then there are a lot of hyperpartisan media outlets and um, political influencers on the right in that in that list. Yeah. So tell us more about the the repeat spreaders. Who else is on that list, and and how how is it that they act uh, that kind of distinguishes them from other accounts? You've said that you know they're they're participating in in that meta narrative, but what does that look like in the mechanics? How do you identify them in your data? Yeah, I mean, we we identify them just by looking at the accounts that are most retweeted in these data sets. But but I will say it's interesting because the the folks that are that end up in this list are, are the most influential, right? They're the ones with the most followers. They get the most engagement. Some of them were saying things that were outright outright false. A few of them have been suspended since for that kind of activity. But a lot of them are still there, and they're very careful about how they talk about make these claims. They often say, oh, this is big if true, and then repeat someone else's claim. They use speculation. They use a lot of what we call expressed uncertainty, uh, where they add enough uncertainty that they don't have to take responsibility for the underlying claim. Um, And then there were other accounts. One of the things that we saw is like all all of these networks of right-wing accounts were just happily excitedly looking for any kind of possible issue with voting, and then they would amplify that. And in, sometimes the issue was real, sometimes it was false. In all cases, what it did was it created this exaggerated sense that you couldn't trust the election results. And then that event eventually feeds in to these more elaborate conspiracy theories. And one of the more interesting things, if you see, it's not their initial tweet. You see how their audience interprets it. So they may say, look, a Democrat, you know, we, we found this plot to register dead people to vote as Democrats or something like that. And so it doesn't actually say, you know, exactly what's happening, but the their audiences clomb onto that and say, oh, look, it's another case of, of Democrat-led voter fraud, um, even though this case has no indication that it was actually perpetrated by anyone who was a Democrat. And in fact, it was done so poorly that it was never going to work and nobody ever used it to commit voter fraud. And yet the audiences would sort of interpret it. So I guess what I'm trying to explain here is like, what would happen is is the, these influencers would put out content that was you know marginally misleading, but their audiences would pick it up and and make this connection to say, oh look, this is another example of voter fraud. This is the mass voter fraud. We've got dead people voting. Oh, Dominion machines are changing votes, and so they often relied on their audiences to understand the subtext uh, of what they of what they were saying. And the subtext was spelled out by Donald Trump, who would say the election is going to be rigged. And um, and so their audiences would interpret these little pieces of of content as more and more evidence that the election would be rigged, even though 
as has been announced in the hearings, there's 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 no evidence that that any of these little kinds of issues added up to systematic voter fraud at a scale that would have changed the results of the election. Yeah, and I think it just further underlines, you know, the difficulty of moderating this kind of content if these tweets are, you know, ambiguous enough or contain enough plausible deniability that it's not, you know, it could be borderline mis or disinformation, but if there's no real content there and it's how it subsequently gets interpreted that's the problem, uh, you know, it really does put companies in a bind in a sense of working out what to do. Um, you know, people are saying or questions are being asked or I've heard that, you know, um, it, it becomes difficult to know where to draw the line. And I think one of the other things that what you're saying highlights is this relationship between top down and, and bottom up stories, you know, whether uh, big accounts pick up things that are percolating on the ground with smaller accounts or whether, you know, things are coming from the top with these ambiguous statements and then being interpreted uh, more broadly. I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about that and if there's one dynamic that particularly dominates this kind of situation. I think, you know, in much of the conversation about what the internet has done uh, to public discourse, it really focuses on that bottom up Uh, source of disinformation and misinformation where you know it's democratized people's access to a to a platform and to to getting information out there and that that's the problem Uh, is that what you're seeing in your research so yeah we've been looking at these sort of top down and bottom up dynamics and um, we've got a couple of papers that are in review right now around what we're calling participatory disinformation and and this understanding that we see the big lies of disinformation campaign and not everybody understood that they were passing along this information. Not everybody understood that they were sharing things that were false, but that's how disinformation works. It actually is, is content that's either false or misleading, but that it's, it, but it's it spread for some sort of goal, but it often incorporates the work of unwitting actors. And we're seeing that unwitting crowds are be, becoming part of these disinformation campaigns. And, um, and what we're seeing is this kind of participatory disinformation where the, the, the frame of voter fraud was set at the absolute top. We can see Donald Trump repeatedly saying the election is going to be rigged and, you know, there are going to be ballots from foreign countries and, you know, and the, the mail-in process is all rigged. And so and, and so he repeated that message over and over again, he and his, and his, and his supporters and then right wing media. And so we get this elite messaging that goes top down that says the election is going to be rigged. And then they 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 asked the audiences to generate the content for that, right? So they actually created the Army for Trump and Defend Your Ballot websites where they told their audience, and, and, and recruiting poll, poll observers and other kinds of things, they told their audiences to go out and look for the evidence. And, and that's what their, you know, everyday Trump supporters did. So from the bottom, these folks went to their mailboxes and then they went to their polls looking for evidence that the election was rigged, and then they misinterpreted what they saw within that frame. And so um, we see this with the case of like Sharpie Gate, where people went and they voted, and the and the Sharpies bled through their ballots, and then they thought that their ballots hadn't counted, and that they were being partic- specifically targeted because they were Trump voters, which both of those claims were false. But that, that's what they thought. They actually experienced the world through this sort of like false frame that had been given to them. And then they created this content. They shared. They shared this online. They shared this through these defend your ballot websites that that the the Trump campaign had provided. And so they, that percolates back up to the the elites and the influencers who then could echo that out to even larger and larger audiences. So you see this interplay between the elites who who set the frame and then encourage their audiences to to share information, to create the evidence to feed these conspiracy theories, and then sort of amplify those conspiracy theories and those claims back. And then the, the bottom of these audiences just like just constantly generating these claims and and they you know throwing spaghetti on the wall, right? I've been talking about this metaphor of like we have this idea you throw spaghetti on the wall to see what sticks. Well, what you know the audiences and everyone's they're throwing spaghetti on the wall, they're throwing spaghetti on the wall, but then the, the, the elites are putting in this voter fraud spaghetti sauce. So this bread voter fraud spaghetti sauce. And so fact checkers are taking the spaghetti off the wall, right? Because eventually all the spaghetti falls down because none of the claims actually actually land. But the red stain is still on the wall, right? So people still think it's rigged. Um, because there's been so, you know, there's so much spaghetti on the wall um, and so, so many claims. And, and those claims were, they were motivated 
you know, they were asked to, you know, the, the audiences were asked to create those claims. And there's an endless number of them because we're basically crowdsourcing the collection of evidence for these conspiracy theories, uh, you know, among hundreds of thousands of, of people who can who can work together to, to create that. I mean, it's a, it's quite a, quite effective. Uh, but it, it is really interesting. And this is, again, what we're talking about is participatory disinformation, this bottom up and top down generation of, of false and misleading narratives. I think that's fascinating. And I mean, it, it reminds me, interestingly, of kind of, of studies of fan culture and, you know, fans of bands or movies or books where there is this kind of you know, you pull people in by creating space for them to make their own thing out of it and, you know, put put their own spin on something and that that is really engaging. And it also makes me think of uh, uh, there's uh, during the January 6th hearings, uh, committee chairman Benny Thompson pulled out the the famous line of who you're going to believe me, your lying eyes. Um, and and what your point about the, you know, Sharpie gate and the sort of the participatory nature of this campaign, I wonder if that kind of disinformation campaign is particularly powerful because the answer to who are you going to believe me or your lying eyes is that, you know, according to people who believed in this myth of voter fraud, their eyes were showing them that the ballots were marked, you know, your ballot is marked with a Sharpie. And so it kind of gives you something to hang that mistruth onto, if that makes sense. Is that is that right? Like, what is it about these campaigns that is particularly powerful? Yeah, there's a great example. I, 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 I completely agree. There's a great example with Sharpie Gates. So after after people heard online, so they went in and they voted and some people were concerned that their ballots had bled through, but they passed them through the machines and, and nobody had problems with them or there might have been a couple of problems. But most people passed through the machines, no problem. If there was a problem, they fixed it. But they went home, they saw online that there were these that there was problems with Sharpie pens and they heard that they might not be counted. And then people started circulating a website that they could go to check the status of their ballot. And so hundreds of people went and they checked the status of their ballot and they put in their, their, their code and, and out came this little sheet that said the status of your ballot and your ballot has been canceled. And, and they, then they took screenshots and they posted these online. So these people now thought that their ballot had been canceled. What they did not see was that there was, on that form, it said that their, it was their earlier mail-in ballot that they were getting the status of. And their earlier mail-in ballot was canceled when they voted in person, which is where they were given the Sharpie pen. And so there was a, they were actually literally misinterpreted this website due to the fact that they thought they were going to be cheated. They end up misinterpreting. The evidence was there, but they didn't, they didn't see it correctly. And then they end up having this experience of being cheated. Oh, my gosh my ballot didn't count. Now, days later, they might have gone back to the system and found out that their ballot did count, but many probably never did that. And in any case, like undoing this experience of being cheated, especially when it comes as part of like, you're healing all these other claims of other people being cheated. That's a power. That, that's not someone didn't tell you you were cheated. You experienced the feeling of being cheated. And I, and I think that's uncorrectable. I don't think, I, mean, I remember seeing it at the time and thinking these folks will never they will never think that they weren't cheated. Even if we show them the evidence that they won't, they weren't. I don't think that's ever going to correct that false experience that, that again, as you said, is so powerful. That also gets to the this question of, you know, what this looks like going forward. I saw uh, you pointed out on, on Twitter, a Washington Post report that the Republican National Committee is now looking for, uh, quote unquote, volunteers to, you know, keep their eyes out for voter fraud so that this sort of participation is going forward and it's continuing to prime people to see cheating. Do you, do you see other instances of this kind of participatory disinformation going forward? Going forward? I mean, I, I, this is what we're, we're, we're continuing to do this research in the election context. And if we thought 2020 was bad, 2022 uh, is, is already got, you know, more content coming through every day than we had in sort of October of 2020, we're we're still talking about 2020 in terms of like the social media. It's it's still sort of people are are sharing these stories and and they're sharing their distrust in the process. And meanwhile, there are a lot of sort of Republican-led efforts to train election observers and recruit election officials who actually believe the big lie, which mean that means that the people that are going in to actually work in our election and facilities in some cases are. Are, are looking for, again, this evidence of 
malfeasance. And what they're going to find is that, yeah, elections are sometimes messy. We, you know, we're, we, we try to do our best and, and we learn from mistakes and, and things happen, but they're going to misinterpret. If, if, if history serves, they're going to misinterpret uh, mistakes or, or, or little issues that are totally fixable with, you know, with this idea that, that, that someone's being cheated and that there's voter fraud happening where it isn't. So that's one concern. Another concern I have is that with so much noise, with false claims about voter fraud and false claims about, you know, election fraud and different kinds of things, you know, then it becomes hard to see where the actual signal might be. So if there is a problem, it might be even harder to see it right now because there's so much, so many of these, these false and misleading claims. And so I'm kind of concerned about both, about, you know, people that are, that are misinterpreting things and, and, and continuing to sow distrust in the process as well as the fact that things could happen and we, we might miss them because because we're, there's so much noise in the system right now. Another question about sort of moving forward from here is this question of whether there is any hope at all of correcting any of this any of these beliefs or whether they've sort of settled in and congealed uh, in certain communities that they can never be dislodged. One way to measure uh, the committee's success might be whether they have any inroads on that. And one thing that's been really striking is, you know, these tapes and these explosive claims of people who might have credibility in those communities, uh, rejecting those ideas in a way that we didn't before. Um, So, you know, there's a lot of research showing how hard it is to correct misinformation once it's been, once it's taken hold. But I've also heard some research that suggests that when you hear it from a friendly actor or someone that you might not necessarily think is coming from the other camp, um, that that might be, you know, an especially effective or a more effective way uh, of, of making inroads. Do you think there's any hope uh, in moving the ball forward at all as a result of this kind of footage and these kinds of revelations? This is where I think we really have to think about different audiences. I imagine there are some Trump supporters for whom like Bill Barr, Ivanka, n- none of these folks mean anything if Donald Trump is still saying that the election was rigged. And and we're going to have to accept that those folks are going to think that the 2020 election was rigged probably for the rest of their lives. Does that mean they'll think that the next election is rigged? Well, they maybe not. And and we do have some evidence that sometimes, you know, if you correct somebody in the moment about something, they're going to dig in their heels, but they may be less likely to believe that same claim later. And there may even be a loss of novelty around some of this, which may diffuse some of its, you know, some of the impetus for it, for these kinds of claims spreading may not be there as the novelty recedes. And so we're trying in our work, we're actually trying to diffuse some of the novelty by just saying, oh, we've seen this claim before. Here's the other six times we've seen it. It wasn't true those times. Probably not going to be true this time. But even, you know, if the veracity isn't something we might not be able to change perceptions of, we might be able to change perceptions of the interestingness. And so that may diffuse some of the the participation. And political climates and outcomes may change in ways that make, you know, people that were predisposed to not believe the results of the 2020 election may like the results of the 2022 election and may be less likely to see voter fraud and malfeasance as part of the results when they align with what their hopes are. And we may see folks, you know, on the other side of the political spectrum begin to turn to some of these as explanations for for things that are happening in the world. So I, I don't have a lot of set expectations because the world just keeps surprising me in so many ways that I've just at this point... I'm just I'm just rolling with the punches like everyone else. But I will say, like, um, I'm not entirely unhopeful. I'm not going to say I'm hopeful. I'm not entirely unhopeful uh, that uh, that there won't be, you know, some diminished efficacy for this kind of big lie type of effort in the future. I think we're still at risk. um, And certainly 2022 and 2024, we're especially at risk. But there's a, there's a, there is a little bit of hopefulness for me that in the broader public, people are going to get savvier and it's just going to be less exciting. But even more so, if again, if we think about audiences, moving beyond just the, the audiences and the, the portion of GOP voters or Trump supporters that may continue to believe the big lie, I think the hearings especially, you know, refuting the big lie are important for a different set of audiences. They're important for you know, the judges, the election officials, the elected officials who make decisions about, you know, what the laws look like going forward and and how, you know, and, and whether or not we allow 
Donald Trump to run again. These kinds of things, or whether whether they support Donald Trump in his in, in another run for presidency, I think there there are folks in certain kinds of roles in society for whom these hearings are probably maybe more important collectively for all of us that that they're hearing th- this message that these just are unfounded claims. I think that's right, and I will say that uh, not entirely unhopeful is my my new gold standard for thinking about uh, <laughs> the the state of American democracy. Well, while, while you were talking about people who did believe in the big lie and and whether they'll continue to hold on to that, it made me think of. Um, I unfortunately can't remember her name, but the the podcast will be wild, which is about the January sixth riot uh, by the folks at Pineapple Street Media, has a really interesting interview with a woman. I believe she's from Idaho who believed the election was stolen, went to January 6th, I believe did not enter the Capitol, still believes that it was stolen, got involved with her local election workers to, you know, try to prevent against voter fraud and and I think is is either running for or ran for public office and and told the podcast that, you know, she she believes that her election was legitimate. Um, and that she has trust in her local election officials because she's seen how the machine works. And so, you know, one way to look at that is to say, as you were kind of saying, you know, you, you trust the election when you like the result. But another way is to say on a small scale, you know, this is someone who didn't trust the mechanics of elections and now has seen one small corner of it and has some faith that at least in, you know, her county in Idaho, that things are are working how they should. So I thought that was kind of a an interesting example of how minds perhaps might be able to be changed in some small way. And I think that speaks to to where, like if we're going to have a positive intervention to help sort of rebuild trust in these, in, in our election systems, it is at the local level where people vote at the local level. Right. And so it, it, there, there's an opportunity for education and for real time information at the local level, which could be really valuable. Unfortunately, our election officials aren't resourced to do it, and they're just they're they're begging for help on sort of addre- addressing mis- misinformation and, and false claims about their work. But they have they're positioned well, especially because yeah, people they, they hey come come be part of this. You can see how it works, and then and then you'll see like all of the different you know ways that we double check things and all of the different processes that are built in to to ensure the security here. Um, that fall away when you're just reading an article from from someone who's halfway across the country or halfway across the world is trying to undermine your, your trust. But when you actually go see how it works, you're gonna you're gonna get this extra context that's missing. And I, so I do th- I, I think that's the point of intervention that's probably most important is election officials and and where possible local media when if they exist in, in the places you know that need them the most. But again, I think we're gonna need to figure out how do we get uh, those election officials the resources they need to be able to proactively communicate about the work that they do in ways that kind of can address, certainly can address the things we've already seen and that we, you know, so much of what we see with conspiracy theories about elections and everything else are, are usually just slight permutations of something we've seen before. So I think there's 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 some possibility to help sort of map out what, what election officials will be able to, will, should expect in terms of mis- and disinformation and to help them communicate, because I think there's a real value there, not for correcting false beliefs from the past, but for preventing new ones from taking root in future elections. I guess an assumption baked into my earlier question about whether, you know, the committee's work might break through even a little bit is that the, the things that they're revealing and showing would even get seen or heard by the people that believe uh, the big lie and other, you know, mis- and disinformation. And it, I guess my question is, is that a warranted assumption? You know, we hear a lot about completely isolated information ecosystems these days. You know, Fox News wasn't even showing the committee hearings at the beginning. And so is it possible that these things will get heard, seen and heard by these communities? What do you see, for example, on Twitter in 2020? Is there any crossover or how much should we really be concerned about just none of this even getting seen, let alone being convincing? Again, I mean, there's we have to think about different audiences. There's probably 20 percent of the U.S. who just isn't isn't going to look at this stuff, and if they do, they're only going to see it through, you know, through the framing of of their hyperpartisan media, and it's it's not going to make a big difference. But 
you know, I, I have my N of two, which are my loved ones, um, who I talk to often and they, and they're Fox news watchers and they are watching the hearings and they, they did on the, the first night they watched it on Fox business, which carried it. Um, and they've been watching the other hearings and it has been a productive pathway for conversations. Uh, again, that's a, a, an N of two. That's, that's not enough to, to make a, a wide, wide scale assumption about other people. But I do think for some portion of, of people that were Trump supporters and or at least voted for Trump and, and are conservative, that for folks who value someone like Bill Barr and understand that when a, when a, for folks who value the voices of other Republicans and saying that this isn't true, there may be some 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 getting through to them. And again, that's not that's not all of the people who believe the big lie, but it might be some portion of the people that b- believe the big lie. And again, you know, it's it's not just it's not just that the broader public has to all ha- we, that we all have to be on the exact same page about what happened. But what we do need is the people that are making decisions about how elections should work in the future and the people that are, you know, making decisions about, you know, whether or not to certify elections, these kinds of things, that they are hearing this. That's what's most important. Yeah. So at at risk of beating a dead horse on this sort of will this change people's minds questions, there was one more point I wanted to get to on this. And that was the, the way that I sort of wondered whether the committee was undercutting the participatory element of this program. And let me explain what I mean there. So they they have, I think, been emphasizing that Trump was sort of been able to build a crowd on January 6th of people who were engaging with falsehoods. And one of the rhetorical moves they've been making is emphasizing how those supporters were cheated, to some extent in a, in a literal sense, arguing that Trump sort of grifted money from his supporters by encouraging them after the election to pitch in to a fund to support election litigation that, according to the committee, didn't actually exist. Um, In another example, it showed testimony from deposition of a campaign staffer who said he felt misled after discovering that the campaign was misrepresenting what it had been doing after the election. And that, that kind of struck me as seeking to undercut the participatory element of disinformation in this sense, and in that it was kind of suggesting that the community that people who found that information meaningful were engaging with was actually cheating them, if that makes sense. I mean, do, you, do you think that might be effective? I don't know. I mean, I, I think maybe for some, uh, for some folks that could, you know, that, 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 that element of grift or like they, you know, they were using you to, to get your money for folks that gave a lot of money, maybe some of them that might be eye opening. but a lot of times once we've invested, we actually double down <laughs> on the kinds of things that, that we have invested in. And so we know that about, you know, if, you, if, a if fundraising group can give you, get you to give a little bit, then they're more likely to give, get you to give more later, right? So once you've made a little contribution, you're more likely to make a bigger one. And, and it's really hard to get people to open their eyes to the fact that they've been fooled, right? Um, but none of, nobody wants to admit that. So I, I think, yeah, you're, you're going to find that it opens some people's eyes, but for others, they're, they're so bought in uh, that, I, that I'm not sure that's going to make a, a big difference. And, and for them, like, this was justified. They're still hearing that message that the election was rigged. They're trying to, they're trying to save their country from an election that was stolen. They're the patriots. They're, they're the ones that are trying to, you know, do the right thing. And, and for them, January 6th was justified. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard. I I think it's hard to draw a broad brush and say, you know, this kind of, this piece of the hearing is going to make a difference for all these people. I think there, there are different pieces that are going to affect different, you know, different audiences in different ways. And again, I still think there's going to be some substantial portion of Trump supporters for whom none of this is ever going to matter because they're so bought in. This is their cause. They, 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 it wasn't just Donald Trump telling them that this was what was going to happen. They got to be part of the production of the big lie. <laughs> they, they own it. <laughs> um, and they, re- many of them received attention and, and in the sense of community through participating in the big lie. And except for the one, you know, for the folks that are now having to pay in terms of, you know, legally because they were, they were on the grounds and they broke the law and even some of them are going to double down. <laughs> um, I don't know. It, it, as we said earlier, this is a really powerful experience and, 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 and for everyday people that got to feel like they had agency that they could actually possibly change the, the effects of, of what they thought to be a rigged election. 
this is something that's now really tied to their identity, their sense of who they are. And these are it's it's difficult to intervene in this kind of all encompassing propaganda. So let's then talk about how the hearings have handled broadcasting that propaganda. Um, we've we've had a lot of discussion in recent years about the danger of you know repeating lies or untruths in the pro- in the process of debunking them. You know that there's a, a risk that you know the, the lie will stick in people's minds as it's repeated, even if it is repeated to say this isn't true. And I've noticed that when the January sixth committee plays clips of, for example, members of the Trump campaign or associates repeating the big lie, they'll kind of put a little disclaimer in front. So Representative Adam Schiff, for example, recently preceded a clip of Rudy Giuliani telling lies about the integrity of the Georgia vote by saying, uh, I want to advise viewers that these statements are completely false and also deeply disturbing. Um, what what do you think of that as a mechanism for kind of inoculating viewers against the lie? Like, should is the committee handling that risk in the right way? It's a, and it's a hard question, and you, and you're, you are noting um, a piece of, actually, it's a whole area of research about, like, how do we correct without exposing people that haven't been exposed in, in ways that may cause them to believe the, the falsehoods? And there are, you know, there are recipes, like the truth sandwich, where you lead with, like, what you're going to see isn't true, which is exactly what that example you explained was trying to do. You lead with, like, this isn't true, and then you show the falsehood, and then you say this isn't true again. And, and that's the best that's best practices for how to communicate this. I, I think it's important to think about, you know, in the context of the hearings, we're not, you're not exposing anyone to the, this content that hasn't been exposed before. And so that, that, that possibility of like, okay, we're, we're actually causing more exposure through our correction. That's, that's not really there. And then the repetition here is that the repetition that this is, as, as it's been quoted, BS is the repetition that come that comes through? So I, I do think that they're handling that pretty well, and that it's not a case where you know this is an a, emergent conspiracy theory that so no one's heard about, and now you're exposing everybody to it. That's a very different kind of situation. This is one everyone's already heard about. Many people are totally bought in, and I don't think that same kind of like first exposure risk is there, where where you may be correcting some, but you're you're bringing more people into the, into sort of this exposed group. I, I don't think that applies in this case. So, but it is it is a concern when when addressing sort of novel misinformation. Yeah. So then let's go back to the platforms because YouTube removed a video from the hearings that included false claims from Trump, um, including you know saying we had glitches where they moved thousands of votes from my account to Biden's account and that the Department of Justice and FBI may have been involved in the imagined plot against him. And the clip itself uh, did not include Barr's repeatedly stated belief that the Trump's stolen election claims were just wrong. YouTube's position, this was not, you know, one of the many instances where, oh no, the algorithm made a mistake, we'll reinstate it. They, you know, uh, doubled down on this saying that its policies apply evenly. And if there's disinformation and there's no refutation of the disinformation, then the video must come down. And on one hand, that kind of makes sense. You know, there's been a lot of hullabaloo recently in the past few years about exceptions for certain actors to otherwise neutral rules. But on the other hand, it's kind of patently absurd, like taking down um, January 6th committee hearings for disinformation about the election it just kind of, you know, makes your brain explode. So I'm wondering, you know, has something gone terribly wrong here uh, in how these sites think about content moderation and neutrality? Like, is this just an impossible situation where there's no right answer? Or, you know, w- what should we think about that kind of decision? I, I mean, I think part of what this example shows is that the platforms, because they're so concerned about concerns of partisanship and bias and different kinds of things, which which is understandable, and because it's actually really hard to assess intent on a single piece of content, that they've created these policies and they apply these policies in a way where they can't look holistically at what is going on. My suggestion would be as a researcher, like you can't really make sense of this until you look at the patterns. Is this an actor that repeatedly puts this kind of stuff out? You know, is this part of a pattern of how they do this? Um, And that you're going to get a much more effective and kind of set of actions from that kind of more holistic approach, but it's really hard to apply. And it's a hard to apply in sort of a crowdsourced way with 
with people that are trained, but, uh, you know, working without the ability to, con you know, have conversations about these kinds of things. I think it's a, just a function of like the way moderation has to work at scale and, and who's doing it and how it has to be structured in accordance with these policies. It's one of those cases where I can understand why the, the, the platform ends up making that decision. It's probably the wrong decision, but it allows them to have sort of this recipe that they can use and they don't have to defend themselves as much around questions of bias. So then what about other interventions that platforms made? You know, we're a couple of years out now, and I'm curious if there are other lessons in the studies that you've been doing since 2020 about, you know, the lead up to January 6th or the election um, as we prepare for the midterms now. You know, platforms did roll out a whole bunch of new civic integrity policies, but also a whole bunch of other kinds of interventions like the famous labels that, you know, suddenly appeared absolutely everywhere uh, across, you know, most of these platforms. Have you seen, you know, do you have any further insights or reflections on those uh, a couple of years later? Did they work at all? <laughs> the research is still kind of out in terms of, of the labels. My understanding is like everything around misinformation corrections is it's all contextual. Some labels may have worked early on for information that was novel. Probably unlikely that the labels made a difference for people that were already sort of bought, bought in to the, the larger framing that the election was rigged. And I think over time, the labels have become sort of part of sort of the polarization of, of the platforms. And I, and I use that as sort of like the people that are, are on the left, often the labels are, are serving to highlight content that, that has been shared by people on the right. And so they like them and people on the right are mostly ignoring them because they perceive them to be biased. And I think um, as that's kind of taking root, they're not going to be very effective for the audiences that likely need them the most. Um, however, there are probably places where labels will, will be useful. I think they're going to be small you know, a small kind of set of cases where the content is, again, where it's an, it's something that's new enough that it can actually make a difference where people's minds aren't already made up. Other kinds of interventions around sort of deplatforming, we, we talked about strikes policies, those kinds of things. We've shown that they can be effective for diminishing sort of the spread of mis and disinformation. Does that mean that's the right thing for the platforms to do, considering some of the other um, concerns we have about freedom of speech, how those policies might be applied in other countries, how platforms might be pressured to deplatform speech that just runs counter to a government narrative that might not be untrue or even misleading. And so I think there's still um, it's still some, some work to be done to kind of think about what's the right balance for some of those policies. But I do, I do think we've seen that they can be effective in, in diffusing like a disinformation kind of network, but I'm not sure that we yet have the exact right strategy for, for how to, address some of what we're seeing. And I don't think it's a platforms alone. It's got to be, you know, the platforms can make some adjustments here and there. I think they can address where their algorithms are being manipulated and where their algorithms are really contributing to the spread of harmful misinformation. But there's, you know, the other dimensions, I think that the, there's still a lot of uncertainty in terms of what's the best path going forward. Let's leave it there. Kate, thank you so much for joining us. All right. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to Arbiters of Truth, the Lawfare podcast series on our online information ecosystem. You can find past episodes in the Lawfare podcast feed and in our separate Arbiters of Truth podcast feed. And we'll be back with another episode next Thursday. The Lawfare podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare podcasts by becoming a material supporter at patreon.com backslash lawfare, where you'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. The podcast is edited by Jen Patya Howell, and our audio engineer this episode was Kara Schillen of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thanks for listening.